Hi guys, welcome back to George Reeves once again. Tonight is chapter 8 of Boom by Mark Haddon. Thank you guys for watching and uh, last time in chapter 7, uh, Jimbo tried to tell Becky what was going on with the strange language and the brass wristband and the man at Captain Chicken, but she didn't believe him. And now he's in a bit of a situation here. Uh, her, her sister doesn't believe him. The watchers are after him. What is he going to do? We're going to find out tonight here at Chapter 8. Okay, so let's get the show on the road. Chapter 8. Goodbye, Charlie. Charlie wasn't at school. I'd taken an early bus and waited at the gates. 800 pupils walked past me, but no Charlie. I stayed put till the bell went, then loped up to the main doors. Perhaps he was ill. Perhaps he was pretending to be ill because he had some cunning plan to work on at home. There was obviously a rational explanation. I just didn't know what it was yet. Then the headmistress made an announcement during assembly and I knew that things were taking a serious turn for the worse. After she told us about arrangements for the forthcoming sports day, Mr Gupta tapped her on the shoulder and whispered something to her ear. Oh yes, said the headmistress. I nearly forgot to mention, Mrs Pierce and Mr Kidd are both off sick. Their classes will be taken by two very nice supplies teachers, Mr. Garrett and Miss Keynes. She nodded towards the two new faces squeezed in at the end of the line of staff. Something was badly wrong. It was too much a coincidence. I tried to persuade myself that Charlie and his dad had solved the puzzle, that they'd gone to the police and that Mr. Kin and Miss Pierce were behind bars, or were headed for the nearest airport. But it didn't seem very likely. I couldn't concentrate. I got a detention from Mr. Garrett and another one from Miss Kaczynski, and I simply didn't care. After lunch, I faked a migraine and went off to the sick bay. I was given two paracetamol and a mug of tea, and, and dr I groaned dramatically until they rang Dad and told him to come and pick me up. I carried on groaning dramatically all the way home on the bus. When we reached the doors to the flats, however, I apologised to Dad, told him I'd explain everything later, Ran off to the back sheds, unled, undid my lock, and broke some kind of land speed record trying to get to Charlie's house. I went through their gate, hit the brakes, turned sideways, and sprayed gravel all over Dr. Box's car. I dropped the brake, ran to the door, and pressed the bell. After a few seconds, Mrs. Brooks leaned up behind the frosted glass window, and the door swung open. She lunged towards me, shouting, Where the hell have you been? You stupid, selfish, thoughtless little. Then she stopped. Oh, it's you. Two hands appeared around Mrs. Brooks' shoulders and moved her gently to one side, as if she were an unexploded bomb. The hands belonged to Dr. Brooks. Jim, he said, his face blank. Come inside and close the door. I stepped onto the mat and squeezed myself around Mrs. Brooks, who had started to cry. Dr. Brooks chivied me down into the hall and into the living room. Where's Charlie? I asked. Charlie's disappeared, he said. What? I tried to sound surprised. He went to bed last night, usual time. He seemed, well, like he always does. But this morning, he simply wasn't there. He shook his head slowly. We've got no idea where he's gone. Out in the hall, I could hear Charlie's mum wailing horribly. Look, you know Charlie. He's always getting into scrapes. He plays silly games. Do you have any idea where I might have got to? I took a deep breath. I was going to sound crazy. I was going to be in trouble. But now wasn't the time to be worrying about that. Charlie rang me last night, I said. He told me to come over. He had something important to tell me. I couldn't come because Dad was cooking a big meal. It was about the code, do you remember? Charlie said you'd solve the puzzle. Yes, yeah, said Dr. Brooks. Yes, we did. Sort of. But I thought that was just a game. Are you saying it has something to do with... What was the answer to the puzzle? I asked. He said you knew what Koryask meant. He rubbed his face with his hands. Koryask, it's a lock in Scotland. On the Isle of Skye. The numbers after it, the ones in brackets, they're a grid reference. You know, so you can find the place on the Ordnance Survey map. He paused. You're not seriously trying to tell me he went to Scotland? Wait, I said, holding my head. It was all falling into place. Mrs Pierce went on holiday to Scotland. She owned a book on Scottish castles. The map in the box of wristbands under the water tank. It was a map of Skye. Jim, asked Dr Brooks. This is going to sound insane. Go on, he urged me. The code? Yes. It was someone's secret. They didn't know anyone they didn't want anyone to know about it. 
Who, Jim, who? Mrs. Pierce, Mr. Kidd, the history teacher, the art teacher. They were up to something. Jim, what the hell are you talking about? I'm being serious, and they weren't in school today. The doorbell rang. I'll be back, said Dr. Brooks. That'll be the police. He disappeared to the hallway. They'd taken Charlie. I knew it. He'd used the wristband, the voice on the other end. They knew. He hadn't behaved. He was facing the consequences. I had to find him. And to find him, I needed clothes. And, and I needed the notebook. And I couldn't trust anyone. I skidded into the hallway and ran up the stairs. I reached Charlie's room. I pulled out drawers. I yanked up the loose floorboard. I looked in the wardrobe. I found them under the mattress, the orange spud vetch notebook, and the brass wristband. I shoved them into my pocket. I stood up and saw the robot piggy bank on the windowsill. I emptied the contents into my hand. Eight pounds sixty-five. I shoved it into my other pocket. When I came back downstairs, I saw Dr. Brooks standing in the middle of the hallway, talking to a large, ginger-haired policeman. The policeman looked up at me. The doctor tells me you're a friend of Charlie's. Yes, I said. Well, perhaps you can help us, he said, taking a small flip-top notepad out of his jacket pocket. Tell him what you told me, said Dr. Brooks. That's stuff about Pearson, what's his name, the art teacher. The policeman's eyebrows lifted. He stared at Dr. Brooks, then he stared at me. That sounds interesting, he said. Well, I began, stinging myself to tell the crazy story all over again. You know what, the policeman smiled. Why don't I give you a lift home? You could tell me all about it on the way. Dr. Brooks nodded to me and said, It's okay, Jim. You go with respect to Happy White. We'll be all right here. Just ring and let us know if you remember anything. I was about to say that I had my bike in the drive when Inspector Helper White grabbed the doorknob. A moment sooner, a moment later, and I wouldn't have seen it. His cuff lifted slightly, and there it was, round his left wrist, a brass band. No, I said, taking a step back up the stairs. Thanks, but I'll be fine. We've got some important things to talk about. And the inspector began to chuckle in a way that was not very convincing. And I'm going to be late for my tea in the canteen. Come on, I can drop you off in a jiffy. I looked towards Dr. Brooks for help, but he didn't know I needed help. I'd rather not, I stammered. The inspector walked over to me and I felt his hand around my arm. If you know things that are significant, you, you should tell us. Withholding information is a very serious offence. I began to pull away, but his grip was like an anaconda's. And all the time he was smiling a big, friendly policeman smile from the middle of his orange beard. If I didn't think fast, I'd be in that car. Charlie, like Char- and I'd disappear, like Charlie. There would be no one to look for me, and there would be no clothes left except the name of a Scottish lock. Fine, I said. I just need to go to the toilet first. I'll wait for you here, said the inspector. I walked into the kitchen. There was no back door. I climbed onto the sink and opened the window. I was stepping across the draining board when I kicked over a large casserole dish. I tried to grab it, but it was too late. It hit the stone floor. I was sound like a gong being strunk. Suddenly, the inspector was at the door yelling, Hey, get back in here. Jim, shouted Dr. Brooks in close pursuit. What are you doing? I launched myself through the window to the sound of china shattering all over me. I hit the grass and rolled over with nice forks and spoons raining all over the ground. I got up, sprinted round the corner of the house, mounted my bike, executed a neat skid around the inspector as he burst out of the front door, rode back over the lawn, then careered through the wind gate into the park and through all of the trees. I sprinted up the steps of the library, leaving my bike unlocked. I leaped through the doors and aimed myself at the information desk. I was breathing so hard I couldn't speak properly. Isle of Sky, Ordnance Survey Map. I need the Ordnance Survey Map. Isle of Skye in Scotland. Thank you, I do know where Isle of Skye is. With agonising slowness, the librarian extracted a grimy white handkerchief from her pocket and blew her nose. Then she repocketed the handkerchief. If you'd like to follow me... Eventually we found ourselves in the map selection. She, she led me to a shelf of pink spines. Typical, she tutted. Everyone's taking them out and putting them back in the wrong order. I pulled a random map out and turned it over. On the rear was a diagram of the entire country divided into little squares. The Isle of Skye was covered by maps 23 and 32. I ran my finger along the pink spines. The librarian found 32. I found 23. Can I take them out? 
I asked, extracting the map 32 from her hands. I'm sorry, she said. Maps can't be borrowed. You'll have to read them here. It was not a day for worrying about fiddling details like library rules. I said, my name is Barry Griffin. I go to St. Thomas's and sprinted for the exit. Only when I got to the flats did I realise what a stupid idea it was going home. Inspector Happerwhite knew my address, and if he didn't, Charlie's father would tell him. I overshot the car park, coming to a halt behind the garages. I got on my bike and poked my head around the corner. The car park was empty. The inspector had been and gone, or hadn't been here yet, or simply assumed I wasn't stupid enough to come back. My head wheeled. But I was going to find Charlie. There was stuff I needed upstairs. I could be in and out in three minutes. I decided to go for it. I ran across a vacant car park, banged through the swing doors and threw myself into the lift. I let myself into the flat and shut the door firmly behind me. I went into my bedroom. I emptied my own savings of £19.52 from the scar box and added them to Charlie's money. I pulled the old ten and one of the sleeping bags down from the hall cupboard and stuffed them into my big sports hall door. I grabbed a change of clothes and went into the kitchen and started filling a Sainsbury bag with food. A loaf, a packet of biscuits, some of Dad's leftovers and a box of Quality Street. I opened the what's it drawer and took out a pen knife, the first aid kit, a torch and a roll of string. I went back into my bedroom and found a compass. As I was doing this, the brass wristband fell out of my pocket. I picked it up and looked at it. Was this how they'd found Charlie? Was it sending out some kind of homing signal? I had to get rid of it. Except that I couldn't get rid of it. It was one, my, my one piece of proof, the one object I possessed that showed me that I was not a deranged lunatic. And then I remembered. Dad lost a plane last year. The park people put corroded iron on the round of the bandstand. The plane flew behind it. The radio contact cut out and it crashed through the boating lake. Radio signals couldn't travel through metal. He proved it by putting the radio in the oven and making it go silent. I grabbed the roll of the cooking foil from under the sink. Tore off a large square and wrapped my wristband in several layers before shoving it in my back pocket. Only when I had finished did I stop and stand still to listen to the ticking of the clock and the buzzing of the refrigerator and realised that the flat was completely empty. No dad? No Becky? Where were they? I suddenly felt cold all over. And that's the end of chapter 8. Thank you guys for watching. Um, a couple of moments ago before I started recording, um, me and my neighbourhood were clapping for the NHS. It's Thursday today, we do that every week. And uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to the NHS for all their hard work during these um, uncertain times. Um, but thank you guys for watching and goodbye until the next video.